welcome to this presentation. I hope you had a great lunch. Uh, I hope I won't uh, bore you to death now, so please be awake. Uh, so first, I wanted to say hi in all the languages of Singapore. Uh, I think I missed a fourth language, or a f how many languages are in Singapore? Four. Four. So I probably missed one, right? You missed Malay. I missed Malay, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, Ni Hao is in Chinese, right? And I in English. So uh, my name is Laurent. I'm the, I'm the founder of Ebay, the company that makes RubyMotion. Uh, I'm, I'm also the author of RubyMotion. I was the original author. And now I actually work with uh, smarter people than me to help me uh, finish it. Uh, I'm a long time Ruby uh, programmer. I discovered Ruby uh, when I was a student at university uh, in 2001. Um, because I needed, I needed a better Perl. I discovered that I couldn't maintain the Perl code I wrote last week. Um, but I never actually used Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, that's pretty one of, uh, that's pretty unique, I guess, in this community. I never did any web programming, so. Uh, and before doing RubyMotion, I worked for Apple for uh, close to seven years on a lot of things from uh, iLife application to OS X. I also maintained the Ruby distribution of OS X from uh, from Lopper to uh, Mountain Lion. And I'm on Twitter where I only post, uh, I try to make puns as good as Tender Love, but they are not as good. Anyway, so I'm from Belgium. Uh, it rains all the time in Belgium, uh, close to 300 uh, days a year. Uh, when I don't do Ruby Motion, I try to maintain the Ruby uh, user group uh, in my hometown. Uh, it's called Ruby Boulet. Uh, boulet is French for huge meatballs, which are the main dish of the city. Uh, so if, if, you ever get, if you guys ever come to uh, Belgium, Belgium is a very small country, so, uh, and you want to try this speciality of our hometown, please let me know and I will set something up. Uh, I'm also the founder of Orval.club, an association of people who strongly believe that Orval is the best beer of the world. Uh, I actually created this club last week, so it's relatively new. <laughs> uh, so this is a picture of the beer. It's, it's, it is the best beer of the world, believe me. And uh, I made a website. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm, not, I'm really not a web programmer, as you can see. Uh, and so I wrote it in pure HTML, because I was told that this day you have to go native, right? Uh, so it's pure HTML, and we have like six members now. So if there are Ruby, if there are overall lovers in that room, uh, if you want to join the club, uh, it's free, but you need to show a proof of face. Uh, so we have, we have, you need to be initiated by an, uh, a member. Anyway, the agenda for today. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the state of native mobile development. I will describe a little bit what Ruby Motion is, for those who don't know. And I will show a couple Ruby Motion gems uh, that are very interesting. And finally, we we'll do some future stuff. That's a secret, hopefully, if I have time. So the state of mobile development. Um, right now, as you know, there are two major uh, mobile platforms, which is uh, iOS and Android. Uh, this is what they look like at the latest versions, um, iOS 8. something and Android 5.2, I think. Uh, so how many iOS users are here? Can you raise your hand? That's not that much, actually. And Android? There are more Android users, I think. So the, the guys who use Android, can you raise your hand if you enjoy the experience? <laughs> yeah. So still good, right? OK. So uh, I'm not a business person, but I, I took this number off from the internet, uh, the smartphone market, basically the share in unit shipments. And uh, Android was winning the last three years, but this year it's actually reducing. The market share is reducing slightly, and iOS is getting more market share this year. But clearly, Android has more uh, units than iOS. Um, and it really depends on the country, but if you, if you do a mobile app these days, you can't just do iOS only anymore. You have to do Android now. So it's no longer possible to, do, to go iOS only. And you need to go cross-platform. Um, the best way also is to go uh, native, to, to write native apps for each platform. Uh, there are many um, tool chain around that, that will promise you that you can write one code base and it works on all the platforms. And they are very nice in theory, but in practice you will run into a lot of problems. You will have performance issues, you, you will not be able to code the entire set of APIs of each platform. 
uh, you have um, user experience problems, um, and eventually you have to write native code. Uh, there was this uh, blog post that was um, published, I think, two weeks ago, that really resumed well the situation of, um, of web technologies to do mobile development these days. And the guy is a web developer, so he actually um, tried to um, synthesize all the, all the problems of what, that are happening right now. So I recommend to, to read it. It's called Web versus Native, Let's Concede Defeat. So it's a very pessimist title, but um, it's very interesting. And native apps provide the best user experience at the end because you really write an application for the entire features of the platform. And it turns out that consumers, they also want the best user experience. So if you do consumer app, uh, you probably have to go native. And as my personal heroes say, um, no pain, no gain, right? So uh, doing native development is much harder than writing an application in Java, sorry, writing an application once in JavaScript and running everywhere. But at the end, you, you have something very nice. So let's talk a little bit about the architecture of, of, of the mobile platforms. Uh, if you look at iOS, iOS is mainly uh, split in four layers. You have CoreOS, Core Services, Media, and Cocoa Touch. Uh, CoreOS is mostly the low-level layer of uh, iOS. So it has the kernel, it has the BSD Unix layer, and also the user run libraries. So you normally never use these when you write an, an app for iOS unless you do low-level programming. But core services include uh, the foundation uh, libraries that powers in the entire set of APIs. Like, you will find the foundation framework there. Foundation defines the built-in classes. Like, you have the NS object class, which is the base class of everything else. You will find NS string, NS array. So all the built-in types. You will also find networking APIs, uh, core data, which is a, a persistence library. Uh, it's I assume it's like Active Record, but for iOS. But since I don't know Rails, I'm not sure. Um, you also have call location. If you work for a secret agency, you probably want to use that um, to track your users. Uh, the media layer has all, everything, graphics, uh, audio, and video. And in the graphics side, you obviously have UIKit. UIKit is the biggest framework. It has all the controls classes. Like, for instance, a button is going to be defined there. And finally, you have the Cocoa Touch layer, which has uh, additional frameworks that you can use on top of your app. For instance, if you want to access the address book, you have an API for that. If you want to access the game board, uh, the game center API or something, if you want to have maps in your app, you have MapKit. Anyway, you will probably have to use the three last layers. And they are, all the APIs are either in pure C or in Objective C. So these are the two languages that Apple use. And it's mostly Objective-C. It's probably 90%, 95% Objective-C. So you have, to, you have to use at least a language that lets you call into Objective-C if you want to use all these APIs. And you have to use Xcode. Xcode is the ID, uh, the default ID of uh, Apple. And if you want to do Objective-C, you're pretty much stuck to Xcode. You can use other IDE, but uh, if you want to do it the Apple way, you need to use that. So it's a, diff it's a new program, you need to learn how to use it. Uh, when it comes to Android, Android also has four layers, more or less. You have Linux, the core libraries, the GDK, and the, the application frameworks. And Linux is mostly drivers and stuff you never need to write an app. Uh, core libraries are C-based libraries. Uh, for instance, OpenGL, SQLite, uh, WebKit, all the libraries that, that are actually used uh, to implement Android. So you, you will probably never use them all as well. There are pretty Java APIs built on top of that. So the GDK is the base of Android, is the, the implementation of the Java language. So you will find them there, uh, the string class, uh, the arrays, all the integers classes. And finally, you have the, the blue layer, the application framework is the stuff that Google wrote for Android. So you will have all the, all the widgets and everything that lets you write a, an Android app. So you have to use the last two layers if you want to write an application for Android. And it's all Java. Uh, Java is the only language, and so you need to call into Java APIs. And you need to use another IDE, obviously. Uh, so Google used to have Eclipse. They used to force people to use Eclipse, uh, which was, and people were suffering because it, Eclipse is a very bad um, program, so they switch to something else, Android Studio. Uh, Android Studio is based on JetBrains IntelliJ, so it's much, much better. Uh, but it's still an IDE, so it's, um, 
So you need to, be able, you need to learn uh, how to use it. Eventually, if you do native development for the two platforms, you need to use uh, either Objective-C or Swift in the iOS part, uh, or Java in the Android part. You need to use Xcode on the iOS part, or Android Studio in the Android part. And you need to call the iOS SDK APIs in the iOS part, and the Android SDK APIs in, in the Android part. So can you see the problem here? You are, you are actually jungling between uh, two different set of languages, two different set of IDEs, and two different set of APIs. So if you, if, if you need to, to write an application, a cross-platform app, uh, it's, going, it's going to be a problem. So can we make this simpler? And obviously, yes, with Ruby Motion, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so RubyMotion is basically a tool chain to write native mobile apps in Ruby. And I underline native here because it's really native. It's important. Really native. It's cross-platform, so it does iOS and Android, uh, and also OS X. You can write OS X apps in RubyMotion, but people don't really care much. But you can write OS X apps. It's designed for Ruby programmers. So it's really designed for Ruby programmers. So, uh, uh, I, will, I will explain a little bit later how RubyMotion is, um, is being used to create projects. But basically, if you're a Ruby programmer, if you use the Ruby ecosystem, uh, you should be at home. And the main goal is to provide a consistent experience for cross-platform native development. So let's go back to the table here. Uh, with RubyMotion, we basically replace uh, the two languages by Ruby. And so you, you, can get, you can use Ruby on both platforms. You don't have to use Objective-C, Swift, and Java. And we replace all the IDEs by the editor you already use. It can be anything. And the terminal, which is something you pretty already know as a Ruby programmer. So as you can see, you still need to learn the iOS SDK APIs and the Android SDK APIs. So RubyMotion will not make you a mobile developer right away if you know Ruby. You still need to learn something. Uh, so there is a learning curve. But it's still easier than having to mix languages and having to, having to mix IDEs. And since you use the same language on both platforms, we can now share common code on, on projects. So uh, a few slides about RubyMotion as a company. It's actually a company. Yeah? So it's commercial and proprietary. Uh, it's not free and open source. Um, so because we want to support it for the long term, so the best way is we found is to actually ask money for it. Uh, if you want to find this picture, you can Google for Angry Richard Stallman, <laughs> uh, which I did. Yeah, Richard Stallman is not happy. Uh, uh, it's 100% bootstrap, so we never took funding. Uh, we are only funded by our customers. Uh, it's profitable since day one. Uh, yeah, funded by our customers. So the customers are actually our investors. They invest in the product uh, directly. Uh, we have thousands of them, uh, actually tens of thousands now. Um, uh, if you go on remotion.com, you will find a list of customers and success stories. But my favorite is a dark room. Uh, does anyone know here dark, a dark room? Can you raise your hand if you play the game? Some of you. So everyone else should actually buy the game. Um, it was created by a guy called Amir, Amir Rajan, uh, who's actually a C-sharp developer. He actually learned Ruby for Ruby Motion because he didn't want to use C-sharp to write games. And it's an adventure game. It's a text-based, it's on iOS, it's extremely popular. Last year, it was uh, the number one top, top paid app in the US App Store, uh, above everything else, so it's very, very popular. And it's 12,000 it's 12, lines of Ruby. There is probably a few thousand lines for the, for the engine. Everything else is a DSL that uh, Amir created for the game. So. And Amir, Amir said in an interview that he used Ruby Motion because Ruby is nice to write uh, domain-specific languages and abstractions. So he really wanted to, to create the whole story as code. And if you want to know more, you can Google for a press coverage. There is a nice article on the New Yorker. So if you want to support indie game developers, uh, it's great. Uh, the timeline of Ruby Motion we launched in 2012 with iOS support. In 2013, we did OS X support. Uh, last year we did Android, and this year we do other things. Uh, notably, one thing that I, I would like to show you uh, at the end of the presentation. But I'm afraid that Ruby Motion is no longer hype. Uh, it's no longer a hype um, technology. And the best metric is uh, the number of Hacker News front page articles, <laughs> which, is, which is down to zero for this year. 
Um, and I, uh, our revenue is relatively growing, so I just wanted to show you that we are not like falling apart. But we, we no longer get on the front page of Hacker News. So it means that we are, we are basically boring, right? So Remotion is now a boring product. But boring means stable, right? Anyway. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I watch this. Sometimes people post something on Hacker News, it goes to the front page and get, it gets killed immediately. Like people really hate it there. So anyway, so let's talk a little bit about Ruby Motion internally. And uh, a very important principle are the unified Ruby runtime approach that we decide to go with Ruby Motion. So basically, uh, we provide custom implementations of the Ruby language for each platform we support. So we, we have an implementation for iOS and an implementation for Android. So it's a lot of work because we have to basically to rewrite uh, Ruby runtime every time. But at the end, it has a lot of benefits. For iOS, we decided to rewrite Ruby on top of the same runtime that powers the Objective-C language. So this runtime is called the Objective-C runtime. It's a, C, a small C library that Objective-C programs use at runtime to create uh, classes, methods, and some objects. And we decided to rewrite the Ruby object model on top of the same runtime. And this runtime obviously powers all the APIs of iOS. For Android, we decided to do uh, something very similar. We rewrote uh, the Ruby object model and all the Ruby uh, runtime on top of GNI, which is a, a, a C uh, API that's exposed by the Java virtual machine. And so we are at the same level as Java. Uh, and since all the APIs are written in Java in Android, uh, we basically sit at the top of the same layer. So it's another implementation of Ruby. So the approach, uh, is very important because since we implement the Ruby object model on top of the native platform runtime every time, it means that all the classes in Ruby version for iOS are actually Objective-C classes. All the methods are Objective-C methods, all the objects are Objective-C objects, and vice versa. Uh, all the classes defined by Apple in Objective-C are automatically available in Ruby, as if they were Ruby classes. And actually, there is no distinction between a Ruby class and an Objective-C class. They're all the same. And the same thing goes for Android. Everything is Java, from classes, methods, and objects. So we, we are doing this because uh, we don't need to, we don't have to ship a separate runtime that talks to uh, the Java or the Objective-C runtime. Uh, we, there won't be any conversion of objects. There won't be uh, exchange of messages. There won't be, there basically won't be anything. Uh, there won't be any breach. So the Ruby code that you write is going to access the exact same runtime as the Java or the Objective-C. Uh, code that is so it's it's extremely performant. At the same time, we also re-implemented the Ruby built-in types on top of the the native counterparts. Uh, the Ruby built-in types include uh, the string class or the array class or the hash class. Uh, the idea beh be behind it is that if we if we don't have our own implementation, if we actually use the the, the, the implementation of the platform. Uh, if you call a native API that ex expects a string, for instance, and you, you can pass any string, it won't have to be converted to a native string. So if all strings are native, then we don't need to convert objects. So for iOS, for instance, string is actually based on NS mutable string, which is a mutable version of NS string defined by Apple in the foundation frameworks. So all strings are actually NS mutable strings in Ruby Motion. The same thing goes for array, hash, fixed name. And for Android, we do something extremely similar. Um, a string in Android is actually a class that implements the Java Lang car sequence protocol because we can't use Java Lang string directly because it's, uh, first it's immutable and second it cannot be subclassed. Uh, but we do something very similar. And then, for instance, an array is always a Java util array, which is the closest thing as an array in Java. So all the, all the building basic types in Ruby Motion for Android are actually going to be GDK objects. So by doing this, uh, we get to call the entire set of APIs for each platform, and all the types are also native. So for instance, this is uh, Hello World for iOS. So it's a, it's a little bit verbose, but this is how iOS is working. Uh, you, you start by creating an application delegate, which will be the delegate of the NS application object. And then you need to override uh, the application did finish launching with option method. Here, we extended the Ruby syntax a little bit. Uh, so that you can define small talk selectors from Ruby. And from there, this is the entry point of your app. And then you can create a UI label, assign it to something, 
Uh, you can create a view controller, uh, put the label in the view controller, and then create a window. Put the view controller in the window, and then show the window. So this is extremely verbose, but this is hello world in Objective-C. And the thing is, this is a one by line mapping with Objective-C. If you write the same thing in Objective-C or Swift, it's going to be the exact same code, more or less. So you really get to call all the APIs of the platform. There is no abstractions, there is no magic here. Uh, UI screen is a class defined in Objective-C. Uh, UI window, all the, all the methods that you see there are actually Objective-C methods. That you get to call them from, uh, from Ruby. And if you type rec, you will get this in the simulator, hello world. The exact same app that you would get if you write it in Objective-C and run, re, run, uh, click on run in Xcode. For Android, this is hello world in Android. It's much uh, simpler, in my opinion. Uh, to create an app in Android, you need to have an activity. Uh, you need to subclass at least an activity, which is the main one. And then you can uh, overload the onCreate method. There, you must call super. It has, you must call super as the first uh, expression. And then we can create a text view, assign it to a text, and then set the content view of our activity to our text view. Again, this is all. If you, do it, if you had to do it in Java, it would be the exact same thing, more or less. It, but here, we do it in Ruby. And there is no magic. There, is, there are no abstractions. Uh, it's, these are direct APIs, direct classes defined in Java. So if you type right, you get this in the uh, emulator, uh, exactly as if it was written in Java. So with this approach, uh, you can call the entire set of APIs at no performance cost because we don't breach uh, an existing runtime. We actually use the same runtime to implement the object model. And the built-in types also don't have to be exchanged. So all the strings are in the strings or Java lang strings. And also with this approach, we can support the new versions of iOS and Android automatically. So when Apple releases a new version of iOS or Google releases a version of Android, we support it right away. Uh, we don't have to uh, create wrappers because it's all dynamic. As an example, last week, uh, Google releases Android M as a preview, and we support it in less than eight hours. Uh, we had to generate files for the compiler and then make a release for our customers, but it's, uh, we, don't, we support uh, all the new versions right away. Uh, uh, another example is static compilation. It's different from other Rubies. Uh, Ruby motion apps are uh, not interpreted. And in fact, there is no interpreter in RubyMotion apps. So if you try to call uh, the evil method with a string, it will raise an exception. So everything is uh, statically compiled into machine code. And we target different architectures. We mostly target ARM for devices and Intel for emulators or simulators. And we target 32-bit and 64-bit variants. And the compilation process is not very hard, uh, but it's very, very different from other Rubies. So we start with a Ruby file, and we use the LLVM uh, uh, compiler framework to generate uh, intermediate representation, and we apply optimization passes, and finally, we generate assembly, and then we create a binary, uh, a self-contained bi binary. So uh, Ruby motion apps are actually native binaries, and for iOS, you will find a native executable, and for Android, you will find a GNI shared library inside the application package. And the original Ruby source code is not present in the application, so you won't find .rb uh, files in the application. They are all compiled. So the command line interface is everything is driven by the command line. Uh, we use rake files, rake as the build system, and rake file as the entire project configuration file. So if you need to modify something, it, uh, it has to be in the rake file. So you don't need to go into an Xcode project or an Android Studio project. And it has a bunch of tasks that you can do that. So it's the terminal and then your favorite editor. And there are plugins for most editors. Uh, obviously, you should be using Vim, uh, but you can use other editors if you want. Uh, <laughs> uh, actually, one of them is RubyMine. RubyMine supports Android natively, so it has auto-completion of APIs, integration with the debugging, so it's pretty nice. Uh, creating a new project from the command line is easy. Motion create, you specify your template, and boom, your project is created. You can go there. If you look at the rec file, with VI of course, uh, uh, you will see that it's only three lines. Uh, the default rec file just sets the name of the application. Everything else is generated for you dynamically. 
So if you want to set the deployment target, for instance, you would do app the deployment target equals something. Um, so that's pretty nice. It's all the configuration is all Ruby. Uh, so as I was saying, yeah, everything is in the rec file. And uh, if you want to run the application locally, you can use the rec, the default rec task on both platform. Uh, for iOS, you can use the rec simulator, which is the default one. And as soon as you type rec simulator, it will build the app and then run it in the simulator. And then you will have an IRB prompt, uh, uh, interactive Ruby shell. There you can type expressions and they will be executed on the simulator. Uh, for Android, it's the exact same thing. You type rake and then you can type expressions there. Uh, to run apps on the device, you can just type rake device. It will push the application on your device, iOS or Android, and it, it will run it. And for Android, we attach uh, the, the dynamic, uh, uh, the interactive Ruby prompt as well. So it's all rake comments, right? There's no, no magic there. And once you're ready to make uh, money, uh, you can type rake archive distribution for iOS, it will generate an IPF file for you. And you can send this IPF file to uh, Apple for, uh, to upload it to the App Store. Uh, for Android, you type rake release and you will get an APK file. Uh, you obviously need to do some configuration before you need to generate a provisioning profile, a code sign certificate for iOS. For Android, you need to, to create um, a keychain uh, from Google. You can request it, it's free. But eventually, once you do that, you, you just generate packages. And these packages are the same packages that you would generate from, uh, from Objective-C, Swift, or Java. So let's go back to, the, to our uh, table here. So we have Ruby as the same language, and your editor and the terminal as the main environment. But you, st you still need to learn the IS SDK APIs and the Android SDK APIs, right? So there is definitely a learning curve, but it makes Ruby Motion developers uh, true native uh, mobile developers. So if you do mobile development with Ruby Motion, you're actually using the same APIs as an Objective-C programmer or a Java programmer. But there is a definitely a learning curve. Uh, it's very hard, it takes time to master both APIs. So can we make this uh, even simpler? And the answer is yes, of course. Uh, now that we support both platforms, there are cross-platform gems available. Basically, a piece of Ruby code that works on both platforms that you can use. And these are just one API that works on both platforms. So this really makes uh, things easier. Uh, so for iOS, there is a project called Red Potion. And for Android, there is a project called Blue Potion. Uh, so people say that it's the rails of Ruby Motion. Uh, but since I don't know rails, I, I have no idea uh, <laughs> if it's true. So these are Ruby Motion potions. Um, so it's basically an environment package for Ruby Motion development. So it's, uh, these are project templates and then a set of portable gems that works on iOS and Android. So for iOS, it's red potion. For Android, it's blue potion. Uh, these are written and maintained by the community, so I, I'm, I have no idea what they are doing. Um, but it's used in production. Actually, there are, there are many, many apps using this in production. So I, I assume it's stable, right? Um, this is how you create a project with a red potion. So they, they have their own command line, potion create. I, I don't know why, I don't, I don't know why actually, I should ask them. And then you can just go to the directory, you can do potion create screen, which would pre probably create a screen file, then you can just bundle and rake and it will run the application, right? Uh, there is a piece of code that they actually sent me uh, today, this morning, so that I can include in the presentation. Um, can you guys read the code, right? So it's, these are two files. The first file uh, defines a new screen, PM screen, that has an action bar, a title, and a style sheet. And then on the onload, onload is a callback, will define a button that, that is uh, using the click me button uh, style. And then on the button, we provide the handler that will open another screen, right? And on the right side of the screen, you have the definition for a style sheet which basically provides the user uh, the look and feel of our button. The click me button is defined there, as you can see. So they decided to go with, um, like in HTML and CSS, I guess, to have like presentation separate from uh, content. So you basically define uh, style sheet objects and screen objects. So this is a piece of code, and then it generates uh, applications for both iOS and Android, and they are exactly the same. Um, so you have two buttons, click me, you have the title bar, so this really reduces uh, 
this makes uh, remote motion cross platform work much, much easier. So obviously, uh, this is just an example, right? If you make apps, the, uh, the, the interfaces will be very different from iOS to Android. For iOS, you really want to follow what Apple does with its own apps, which, are, which are, right now are uh, animations and transparency. And for Android, you want to follow the, uh, the design language uh, from Google, and it's relatively stable these days. But still, it's, it's kind of nice to be able to act, actually share the same, really, uh, the same DSL on both platforms. And they have another very cool feature, which is uh, live reloading. Uh, if you start changing your screen files, uh, it will reload the application in the simulator. So here, I think it's, uh, it's basically changing stuff in the file. As you can see on the right, there is the IS simulator, and the application is automatically reloading. So they actually wrote a piece of code that watches all the RB files of the project. Then they do a diff, and then they just inject it into the Ripple. So the, the code will be re-evaluated. And, and then I guess they have some dark magic to uh, tell iOS to reload the classes and the controllers. But uh, Anyway. This is called reloading for a... Um, so there is more information on redpotion.org if you want to use that. And now let's, uh, let's talk about future stuff. I think I have some time. And the future stuff are video games. Uh, uh, I really want Remotion to uh, be used to write cross-platform mobile games in Ruby. So this is the next thing I want to do. And I will do a demo. I will write this program. <laughs> I will write this program in front of you. So it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. So we try to do it as fast as possible. Okay. Uh, okay. So this is my terminal. This is my simulator here. And so I have, uh, so for that, uh, we're using a new product that I've been working on that will ship inside Ruby Motion this year. It's called Motion Game. I will talk about it later, but basically we have this uh, game scene file. That's relatively empty. And I'm going to write a Flappy Bird in front of you in 100 lines of code. So very small, right? So I'm actually going to uh, load it in MacVim. What's happening here? Uh, edit anyway. Okay, uh, I'm going to cheat because I'm not going to type the code. I'm going to use a program that I wrote uh, to copy paste stuff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because I, I know that if I type, you know, it's going to take long and I'm going to introduce typos. So first, let's initialize some backgrounds. Boom. <laughs> so we create an array, right? You get it, right? Oh, I forgot to mention. So this is a game scene. So we subclass an M scene. And the update method here will be called for every frame. So by default, it's 60 times a second. So then I, let's add my skyline. So, oops, that's a method. So actually, let me define this here. OK. So I define a hat skyline method that basically creates two sprites, skyline.png. I, I create it twice. And I store the, the sprite in my background array. Why do I create two Skyline sprites? I will tell, I will tell you that right after. There is a, there is a reason for that. Um, important reason. Um, now let, let's define my ground method there. So this is the same thing, right? I generate two sprites, ground.png. Again, you might ask, why is he creating two sprites? Uh, it should create only one. I will tell you that later. Now, in my update method, I can copy-paste this code. And this is why it's important. So if you ever play Flappy Bird, you can see that the skyline and the ground are actually moving. There is an illusion that you are actually flying over a city, right? So here, I, have, uh, I, have, I create two, two separate sprites for each background object. And uh, I move them like this. 
And when the first one is uh, hidden, I put it there. You see? So this is the best way I could find. I know nothing about video game programming, so. But I think it's pretty smart. I was very happy with the result. Um, <laughs> so I have this, and now I can, oh, here I'm going to, uh, to add skyline and add ground. Okay. Now if I type break. Oh. Mm, no internet. I have my skyline that's moving and my ground that's moving, right? So that's the very basic of the game. Now I can just uh, quit here. What the hell is that, STT? Okay. Uh, so let's do something else. Uh, let's add the bird, yeah. Now we're going to add our bird object. So I have my bird here. And it's a sprite that we position uh, relatively at the center of the screen. And then we have this animate method that we start an animation of the sprite. So you can, you can pass as many files as you want, but here we, we have basically three images for a sprite, for BERT. And we tell the, the game engine to uh, each zero that five seconds to switch to the other sprite. So there is, there's gonna be a, an animation here. And we tell the game engine to animate forever. So now if I call add bird, add bird here. Like I add type break. Oops, again, okay, simulator. As you can see, each time it's compiling Ruby file into machine code, so. Now I have my bird here, oops. Actually, let me uh, turn off Wi-Fi. So the bird is there and it's animating, right? And from the ripple here, I can actually ac access my bird. My bird is there, it's a sprite. Uh, and you can, you, can have, you can do actions like, uh, let's ask for the position of the bird. It's 100 to something, so I can, I can say move to. Move to this position in two seconds. It's going to take two seconds to move to this position, right? Uh, I'll move back here. Move back here as fast as possible, okay. And you can also make it blink, so well, there is a blink method that say blink uh, three times in 0 0.5 seconds. So that's useful if, you, if, the, if your object is colliding with something, like in all video games, retro game, you blinking the the sprite, so my bird is there, so let's, let's, let's do some uh, physics. Um, so we have to do some science here. Uh, physics categories first. So, uh, so the game engine has a physics engine, of course, and first we need to define categories. So I'm going to define uh, two categories. These are actually a, a bit set. There is a bird and a world category. So here we assume that the bird is, is its own physics engine physics type, and everything else is the world. So as soon as the bird contacts with the world, uh, the game is over. So we, do a, we start with something very simple. So I can, we need to initialize gravity in our scene. So right there I can copy paste this. And basically set the gravity to zero and something. I don't know the units there, but it's minus means it's going down. Uh, if, you, if you do a positive fix them, the bird is going up. So I put my gravity there, and then I will, I will attach uh, physics properties to the ground. So right there I can copy paste this. So I will basically say that uh, the ground now has a physics box, and um, the, the, its category is the world, but it has to contact the bird. And here, I will do the same thing for my bird. So the category of the bird, the category of the bird is the bird, and the contact is the world. 
not, not, not that I did that. I can actually start the game again. Ah. Should make it the default task. Ah. You can see the bird automatically falls, right? So the bird is attracted to the ground. Um, my bird is there, so if I change the gravity to zero uh, something positive, the bird will fall, right? Then I, I can put it back to something and it should fall down. Where is happening? Where is my, oh, there we go, right? So that's basically physics. And as you can, as you can see, the bird, the bird actually goes on the floor and then doesn't go uh, further down. It's because the, 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 the floor has actually a, a, its own physics category. So my bird is there. No, we're almost done, right? So be patient. Uh, right there, we will uh, redefine on touch under uh, block. So when, when the game engine receives a, a touch event, it's going to call my block. And here I will play uh, some audio file, and then I will apply a velocity on my bird. I'll apply a velocity of 0 to 200. Uh, 0 is x, 200 is y, so basically the bird will move 200 units uh, in the y, uh, y position here. So if I type break, IS simulator again, I put some sound here. Oh, you can see. As soon, I'm, I'm actually typing on my on my uh, touchpad here. Boom. So if I type, the bird is going up, right? No, let's let's finish the game quickly because I'm running out of time. So uh, in my update method here, I want to uh, rotate the bird uh, based on its position. So if the bird is actually going up, I want to rotate the bird this way. And if it's falling down, I want to rotate the bird this way. Um, we're going to initialize, uh, we, no, we're going to make the pipes appear. Oops. So let's go there and let's initialize some variables here. And then here, I'm going to create my add pipe. Method. So this method creates uh, pipes. So Flappy Bird is a game where you have a bird and you have pipes appearing. And for each pipe, you basically have two uh, sprites. You have the, the hub and the bottom part of the pipe. And obviously, since you want the game fun, you want to use some random, uh, you want some randomization here. So we basically generate our pipes and randomly uh, so that they, the bird has to actually um, go inside. And the pipe is simple here. Uh, we have, uh, again, a category here. So the pipe is the, the physics category word, and it can contact the bird. And the, the difference is that as soon as we add a pipe, we actually say the pipe move by something very left. So that as soon as you add the pipe, the pipe is going to move on the, on, the, on the left bottom of the screen. So it will be up to the bird to actually figure out a way to not hit the pipe, right? So I do that. And now I need to make the pipe appear. So in my update method, I can do that here. I can make a pipe appear every two seconds. So how do I know exactly uh, if we pass two seconds? The argument of our update method is the delta, the number of seconds is the previous frame. So I can just add this into an instance variable and if it's over two, I know that we actually spent two seconds. So I can just call the add pipe up here and then reset the timer. And finally here I can I can detect collisions. So there is a handler here, on contact begin. And uh, if, there is a, if the physics engine detects a collision, we'll play, it will yield this block, and then we play a, so, so an audio file, and we print some message on the terminal. So obviously here, as a real game, you want to show a, a game over screen, but. So if I type break, I guess simulator. And my game is here, so, and the pipes are appearing, so 
this is working. And if I hit the pipe, you see, game over, right? <laughs> and all the <laughs> okay. No, I lost, right? So my bird is there. <laughs> I can put it back actually, but I need to be very, very quickly. So. Ooh. <laughs> oh. Where's my Where's my bird? Oh no. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, video game programming is hard, right? <laughs> so this is a Flappy Bird in Ruby Motion game, and it's uh, 113 lines. And with actually comments, so if you remove the comments, because comments are useless, uh, it, it gets to uh, 100 lines. So let's go back to the slides. Uh, Uh, okay, so motion game, you write mobile games in Ruby with Ruby Motion, and this one is 100 cross platform. So I didn't show it, but the same code base runs on Android. So uh, iOS and Android, uh, very nice. So it's fully featured, it has a bunch of stuff that I have no idea about, like the scene graph, 2D sprites, actions, events, sensors, physics, particles networking APIs, so it's, it's pretty nice. And it's based on well-tested open source components because we are extremely lazy. We are using other people's work uh, for that. And it's going to be released later this year. So the idea is to, to actually uh, allow Ruby programmers to write very nice mobile games, but to, to write them in Ruby. So conclusion, uh, Remotion lets you write mobile apps and games very soon, uh, through native apps actually. Uh, real native apps. So remember, there is a learning curve, but uh, no pain, no gain, right? You can use all the platform APIs at no performance expense. It's statically compiled uh, into machine code, so there is no interpreter. You share common code, uh, because it's the same language. There are cross-platform gems, red potion and blue potion. Uh, it's only one language, Ruby, and one interface, your favorite editor, and the terminal. And just one more thing, we do an annual conference every year. This year it's going to be in Paris, 1st and 2nd of July. Conference.rubymotion.com. This is a picture of Paris, nice. Uh, the conference will actually be in this building, uh, not in the Eiffel Tower, but it's nice. And again, conference.rubymotion.com. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was so cool. We've had a lot of demonstrations today so far. I hope you've enjoyed that as much as I do. We have time for maybe one or two quick questions, if you have any for Laurent. Hello. Uh, what is your experience in debugging Ruby motion code? That's all. So, yeah. So, uh, so the Ruby motion compiler actually generates uh, dwarf metadata and attaches it to the binary. So you can actually connect any, uh, any debugger like GDB or LLDB in a Ruby motion program and you can set broad points, uh, see backtraces, these kind of things. It's, it's all working automatically. You can also connect uh, any profiler like instruments and you will see the backtrace of allocations. Uh, we, we really support this metadata dwarf so it's a big deal. Uh, when it comes to real debugging, if you want a point and click uh, experience, uh, RubyMine is really the best. RubyMine integrates with uh, LLDB uh, so that you can point and click lines in your projects and it will break right away. So if you're not comfortable with, the, with GDB or LLDB, uh, you can use RubyMine. Uh, but otherwise, that's, that's more or less the debugging uh, story here. So we support uh, C-level debuggers and also uh, abstractions. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? If not, uh, maybe you can find Laurent afterwards during one of the breaks. Thank you so much. Let's Thank give you. him another round and invite our next speaker.